my my mom has not bought that one, which I don't know if I'm happy or sad about, <laughs> but I'm hoping someone does. <laughs> She's familiar with your bowl, I think. <laughs> Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I am once again chatting with Joseph Zala. If you are an OG listener of Obsessed Show, you may remember several episodes, or maybe you're an OG listener of the Grits and Grids podcast, and maybe you've heard me on there. Anyhow, Joseph is a longtime friend of mine, and we recently reconnected to learn a little bit about his upcoming book, and so we've got him back on the show today. So... As we dig in a little bit, Joseph is the managing director of Vigor, a restaurant and uh, food branding and marketing agency. He's the founder and curator of Grits and Grids and host of the Fork Tales podcast. And as I mentioned a minute ago, he's the author of a brand new book called The Bullhearted Brand. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Joseph Zala. Okay, kids, all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, we've got Joseph Zella. Joseph, welcome back to Obsessed Show. It's good to be back. It's good to talk to you again. Yeah, you're looking well, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a face for radio, as they all say. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Well, last we left you, you were doing a few things differently, um, and you have just really, really leaned into the food uh, and restaurant marketing and branding uh, on all venues, uh, you know, early on there was the, the grits and grids podcast, uh, and now grits and grids has evolved a little bit. Tell us a little bit about how that has changed. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we had the grits and grids podcast and it was fantastic, uh, to, to be able to speak to so many wonderful creatives. Um, at that time you, you were in your previous life, uh, <laughs> as an agency yeah, I guess owner, I've evolved a little bit myself too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Just a little <laughs> bit. Right. Um, and it was awesome because we got to get some good perspectives from, uh, how different folks approach creativity, design, uh, challenges, um, and, you know, whether it was speaking, I'm going to name drop so hard, whether it was speaking with like Debbie, Debbie Millman or, uh, Paula Scherer, uh, or Michael Barut, uh, or speaking just with up and coming, um, folks who are looking to be better designers. It was just wonderful to connect, but quite honestly, it didn't really, um, do much for my, my personal brand or, or the Vigor brand, or even grits and grids, uh, in a way that I think was important. And if I'm being even more brutally honest, there are plenty of podcasts out there that were just doing a better job. Um, Mm. you know, I I had fun and I think, I hope my guests did too, but you know, there's a lot of other design podcasts that I think were just covering it better and a little bit more reliable. And so we chose to, to put it on hiatus and then it turned into permanent uh, hiatus. Um, but what I still wanted to do was still bring knowledge and insight to the world and to what audience we have, um, it just changed, you know, what, what insight I wanted to bring. And what I realized is I really want to speak to restaurant owners. So creatives can actually hear from them, uh, and learn what keeps them up at night. Um, but also because that's who we really want to be speaking with. That's who we want to dialogue with. So we talk a lot of times on this show about origin stories. And if, our listeners really want to hear yours. They can go back and listen to the previous episodes. So we won't dig into that again, but maybe as a refresh for everybody, how did you get into to food and restaurant branding? You know, what was it about that? I've heard lots of people say, oh man, I really want to get into that, but I don't know where to start. Like, how did, how did you find your way in that space? Yeah. So it, it, it wasn't uh, totally haphazard, you know, as with everything there, there is a bit of kismet. There is a bit of alignment of stars um, that always happens. But for me, my, my belief has always been that as humans, our most wonderful memories are usually accentuated with food and beverage somewhere in or around. And that could be something as simple as hanging out in the kitchen at a party. Cause for whatever reason, kitchens become the epicenter of a party mm-hmm. um, or something a little more grandiose where it's a, a date with someone that you're um, that you've been with for a while. And you're in a place where you're going to propose. Usually that happens in a restaurant. And when I thought about 
the types of restaurants I've been in, I, I know that there are some remarkable ones. And there's also some pretty terrible ones. And I got pretty mad about the terrible ones. And it's like, why, mm. why does this happen? Um, and so it started there. So my passion for restaurants really did fuel my purpose in life, which I really do think is to help create remarkable, extraordinary experiences for restaurants. Um, so Vigor started as a general practitioner, uh, just as with all of our studios, I'm sure like I can design anything for everyone because I'm a superhuman. Um, but quickly, <laughs> you know, we got an opportunity to work with a restaurant and that that little morsel, that little amuse-bouche, as it were, was enough to really let's focus it in. Um, and then when the economy hit, uh, when it crashed in, in 2008, it really was a, a, come, a come to Jesus, so to speak, where it's like things aren't well. You know, things aren't good. So if I'm going to spend my time, I want to spend it on something that I find fulfilling. And it went right back to that purpose. Yeah. So uh, the Grits and Grids podcast is on permanent hiatus, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we have Fork Tales. Tell us a little bit about what that show is and how that's different. Yeah. Yeah. So Fork Tales. So Grits and Grids was focusing on bringing creative leaders to creatives from around the world to give some sort of insight in the way they think, the way they got started, what makes them tick. Uh, again, fun. It was a lot of fun. It was great to speak to some of these folks. Um, Fork Tales, on the other hand, speaks to restaurant industry leaders, whether that is uh, C-level executives at restaurant brands like Duck Donuts and um, some others, uh, Another Broken Egg. I just spoke with Paul Macaluso on there. Um, or folks who are in the industry in some way. So uh, one of my first episodes was with Kelly Valade, who heads up Black Box Intelligence. They're a group that has just been pulling a ton of data from the restaurant industry, from uh, point of sale, co uh, consumer perspective, stuff like that. Um, and this has been absolutely wonderful because rare is the case that we get access to those individuals to really hear not just how they got to where they are, but the things that are keeping them up at night, the things that are uh, in their focus right now. And so Fork Tales is uh, meant to tell those tales and bring those voices to the forefront um, for our clients, which are mostly restaurants, um, folks in our network, that uh, as a mix of restaurants and creatives and the creative community, because there's a lot to learn from these folks. Yeah, I would imagine as much as maybe other creatives and designers aren't necessarily the main audience there, that other creatives and designers who are interested in the restaurant world and how the business of food and beverage works would find a lot of value in kind of being a fly on the wall for those episodes as well. Yeah, they certainly should because, you know. We, we, we can get a little navel gazy as creatives, mm -hmm. you know, um, we, we can hop onto Armin Witt's uh, brand new and, you know, tear apart the logos with the rest of them. Um, but at the end of the day, at the beginning of the day and at the middle of the day, actually the entire day, <laughs> what we're doing is, is an applied art. It is a, it is a, uh, a commercial purpose behind it. And that commercial purpose is to make money for our clients. And I think that gets lost. Um, as we stare into the abyss of creativity, well, a lot of times creativity can be, um, I think used for, uh, vanity purposes mm -hmm. and, and, you know, sometimes there's beautiful work and that business fails. And when I was speaking to Michael Barut, um, on the grits and grits podcast, he, he definitely, sh you know, shirked, maybe that's a harsh word. He definitely kind of brushed off that their work had anything to do with the failure. And I'm not saying that because of their work at they, one of these, uh, this, this, uh, it was called on rye, this restaurant on rye. I'm not saying that their work somehow led to their failure, but you better believe that designers and creatives and advertising agencies, they sure as hell will take the wins and say it's because of them. But mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what I wanted to do is, um, really tap into how do you apply creativity to that end goal of successes, whatever successes look like for that particular brand and company. So this one time I was on a plane and I was flying to see a client and I thought, what do I need to have more, you know, authority when I walk in the room? What do I need? What would, what would help me make a better case for why they should hire this little branding agency from Indianapolis? A fedora. 
The answer is a fedora. <laughs> well, that may have been a correct answer, although they don't make fedoras big enough for this noggin. <laughs> It would just look like a little yarmulke with a brim. Um, so what I decided at 40,000 feet was I should write a book. Mm. And, you know, I went several years of knowing that I needed to write this book before I actually got around to it. And uh, and you've now written several books. Your new book is called The Bullhearted Brand. Um, what inspired this particular book for you? Like, why why write this book? Yeah. So, um, full unadulterated commitment to the vigor brand. Uh, so the, the name vigor, uh, which is our uh, branding and marketing agency, uh, stems from the bull as a spirit animal. And, um, there are a lot of attributes of bulls that people maybe not don't really know about. There's of course virility. Uh, and we think that's like virility of thought and, uh, creativity. There's also this, this impetus, this almost juggernautness of bulls. Mm. Um, and then when I started digging into the metaphors that, um, cultures and across the world and across time, the metaphors that have been associated with bulls, it just became this rich well of lessons. Um, and those lessons inherently lined up with the way we think at figure, um, which inherently lines up with how we approach branding and marketing. Um, and I drink my own Kool-Aid, uh, as it were. So those lessons then started to, you know, form a path for what I thought was a good basis for a book. And so to me, a bullhearted brand is one that doesn't back down from challenges. And I think that's lower hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. um, it starts with a bullhearted leader, a leader who is uh, not just willing, but eager to grab the bull by the horns. Um, not just because they're the end all be all epicenter of the brand, but because there's a lot of lessons from the 95 and 96 Chicago bulls mm -hmm. and which is all about people, right people in the right place, right processes and leaders on that team. And so everywhere I looked, bulls had something to do with amazing, deep, profound insights and successes. Um, so I use those stories to deliver a lesson. And then I expound upon that lesson with my knowledge, um, how to build uh, brand strategies, which then inevitably lead to how that brand presents itself to the market, which is where designers and creatives come in. Um, how you evolve that brand forward over time uh, to make sure it doesn't get sticky or, uh, or not sticky, doesn't get uh, dusty uh, or old. Mm -hmm. And then how do you propel it forward? How do you propel that brand to the forefront, to the top? And so the subline of the book is uh, building bullish restaurant brands that charge ahead of the herd. And that's the whole mm -hmm. goal. It's not to fit in, it's to stand out. And um, so in the 275 pages, uh, I, I think I, I lay that out. And at the very least, you get those lessons from the bulls. And then I finally, I mix in some firsthand experiences. So in real life is, I think, the title of those sections. But the good, the bad, and the, the really ugly. Um, so folks who are reading the book can learn. I love that you included Michael Jordan's bulls as part of that. Uh, <laughs> Had to, example. you know, it crossed my mind. Yeah. It was so funny because, um, you know, I have this whole section of the book is on, on people. So it's, yeah. um, what we call patrons, what a lot of people call target audience, target market. Um, for anyone that knows me, they know what I'm about to say, but I, I can't stand that word. I think it's the most violent way of talking about people you're supposed to be friends with. Mm -hmm. And you know that and what you're trying to do in business is you're not trying to target, you're not trying to shoot them. You're you're trying to foster belief, you're trying to foster trust and and you're trying to essentially foster patronage. So we call them patrons. Um and those patrons exist inside your organization in, in the uh, form of your team and your mm -hmm. people. And they of course exist outside the organization. And I think specifically in restaurants there, there we're seeing the results of it right now with this, um, this uh, uh, crisis of labor um, mm -hmm. where restaurant owners are under attack by people who don't understand the industry and, um, and restaurant owners also have been really poor at fostering good patronage within their, their four walls. And instead, a lot of them just see those people as a means to an end. And um, when you start to realize that you have Michael Jordans 
mm -hmm. your team. You got Scotty yeah. Pippins. Let's not forget Scotty. You know, you have these components that will win you championships every day. And yeah, you want to get fans in the seats so you can make the money. But that doesn't happen by walking all over your your rock stars and all the people that support them. And so uh, there was uh, the the special on Netflix, and it was an aha moment for me. I'm like, how could I forget the Chicago <laughs> Bulls? Like, what a Bull story, you know? And interesting how, at least from the perspective of that documentary, how the organization let the team fall apart. Like mm -hmm. They just chose to let their rock stars walk away. Um, off it's sad. Sunset. Yeah. Really sad. I was a huge Bulls fan. Still am. So that's very cool. Um, so I understand from what you've said from context that this sounds like it's a book for restaurant owners or those in the food and Bev world. Is that just who this is for or uh, who else are, might be patrons of the book? Yeah, I, I think um, creatives who are aspiring to be more than pixel pushers. Uh, should definitely read the book and understand it. Um, after absorbing its contents, I think that readers will have a deep, applicable understanding of what a brand is, the components of it, and how to build one. And there's only a small part that's about design. You know, mm. design... You can learn that. There's plenty of examples. Grits and Grids is a font of inspiration where you can find great looks. It's not a design book. Um, instead, it's all the things that lead up to ensuring that the design that you create applies and communicates uh, that brand's heartbeat. Um, and so I do think it would be them. And then anyone that has any kind of imagination could read the book and easily see how this brand framework applies to everything from personal brands to pharma, medical, like every industry, like brands are all comprised of the same components. And this may sound arrogant, but to date, I haven't, I've, I've had a gripe with the way agencies and studios and strategists, how they've talked about those components, because there's always been something missing. And so to give a little bit of a insight there, the missing thing for me is everyone looks inside the brand and they gaze inside the brand. And it's all about the components of the company and all that. And, and that's great. That's important. Um, and then they'll talk about the target market mm -hmm. and yada, yada. And then there's like this, this gap just in between those two things. And I'm like, well, the whole purpose of what we're doing is we're trying to make that gap non-existent. We want to bring the people, the, the patrons, as we call them, we want to rope them closer or lasso them closer mm -hmm. to our brand. And we want to create an unbreakable bond. And that's why... Um, we created this, this diagram that then also fueled the book called The Golden Lasso, where the whole purpose of this brand, the whole reason, um, not purpose, because that's a, a word that means something else, but the, the motivations behind everything we do for this brand is to essentially lasso ourselves, the brand, closer to the people that we want to love us. And the way that that's done is by understanding that this is going to be a newsflash. This might, good thing you're sitting down, but you know, I, I look at Josh and I see a, a white uh, 40 something male, relatively successful. Um, does that really, is that really who you are? No, that's not who you are. No, that you have all kinds of choices that you've made that you've surrounded yourself with that are based on more than just function, functional uh, requirements. You know, if that were the case, we'd all drive a black car with four wheels, same engine, same steering wheel, blah, blah, blah. No, we choose brands because we're looking to communicate something to the world. Mm -hmm. um, and brands give us a way to do that. And so I have this anecdote of a, of a, um, fictional person called Lauren. And if I told you that Lauren uh, shops, wears Lululemon, drives a Prius, goes to Whole Foods, and has an Orange Theory subscription, you would start to have a very realistic understanding of who Lauren wants you to think she is. Mm -hmm. Now, I could tell you that Lauren only goes to the hot bar at Whole Foods, keeps the Prius in uh, gas mode, um, only wears the lemon wearing around the house and hasn't actually been to a class at Orange Theory. It wouldn't change 
her motivations. Her motivations yeah. are to project this, this person to the world. So they have an, a, an opinion. The same goes for restaurants. Um, what we're trying to do when we're developing brands and, and marketing is we want to fill in the blanks of, or, or what we want people to empower people to say, I'm a Josh Miles grill kind of guy. You know, and that should mean something. So when my friends hear me say that, they're like, oh, and then all of a sudden, all of the juice from that brand is absorbed into Joseph's, um, you know, persona. And we call that a projection layer. So we yeah. get really deep into this and very heady. And because I think that's the magic, that's the gap that a lot of places have missed when they're illustrating and talking about brands. That's really interesting. Um I have to imagine we have lots of listeners who are thinking, well, man, I should write a book too. Um, you know, or I'm, I've, th maybe you were in the place where I was, that was, you've known for four years, you should be writing this book. You just aren't doing it yet. So talk to us a little bit about what the process looked like for you, like how you got it started, how long it took, like how you found time to, or made time to make this work. Yeah. Yeah. Those are really big questions. Um, <clears throat> so in, in reality, one could say that I have been writing this book for 10 years, mm. um, that while true, I haven't spent 10 years writing it, if that makes sense. Um, so when I first moved from Pennsylvania to Georgia, um, I had the same kind of discussion with, uh, the inner Joseph, like I, I should write a book mm -hmm. because, one, I don't want to have to field the same questions that I seem to be fielding on every single phone call. If I can put that into a book, one, I establish authority. Two, I hopefully prevent having to answer those questions and um, everyone's happy. The other impetus behind that is I started designing a brochure. And for those who aren't sitting down, you should. Nobody wants a brochure. Like <laughs> nobody they like, haven't for 20 years. Yeah. I mean, they, no one is sitting at their desk saying, gosh, my life would be complete if I would just get a brochure. So I wrote this book called fire it up and it was full of piss and vinegar. And, um, it was my attitude at the time. Again, this is coming from being in the uh, throes of a recession, moving my entire life. Um, and, and just a, a complete uproot. So it was not the tone of voice that I wanted. So I knew, I would say a year or two afterwards that I wanted to rewrite Fire It Up and I wanted it to be more valuable for the reader. Um, and then it took a while, you know, and there was, mm -hmm. there was hiatuses, hi hiatus I, I don't know what the, <laughs> the plural is. I really hope the plural of hiatus ends in an I, that would, that I want it to, that would please me. Hey, English is a, is a moving target, man. It's uh <laughs> it can be if we want it to. Um, so I think I really started to hit momentum and, um, I really got energy behind it. Uh, I would say the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had written, I had deleted, I had rewritten, I had deleted, I, you know, back, backtrack oh, that dance. <laughs> yeah. And it's terrible. It really is. And so, um, I got to a point in my brain where I'm like, okay, one last time. Let's start with what do I want this thing to do? And so I, I stepped out of the document I was working on. And I said, okay, here are the three things I want people to walk away with this. Starting with who do I want to read it? Um, and with Vigor, we have a, a, an interesting balance. And so while we have a niche, the reason why our niche works so well is because it's so diverse. Um, and what I realized is we have a large swath of people that are starting brands and that could be Mr. And Mrs. Miles that have a fun and want to find a cool way to blow it, have an idea for a restaurant. There's those yeah. folks. There are the big brands that are launching a new brand. And then there's this big gap of people we just can't work with because of financial reasons. They just don't have the capital to work and invest. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of that is where the money comes back again and there's money fueled. So I want to talk to two different groups of people. Um, so I got that under in my view. Here's who I want to read this. Here's what I think they need to walk away with and what they're really going to want. And then I reevaluated my outline. Mm -hmm. And then I got the outline together with just headlines um, that I committed to not caring if they were perfect. Just I needed the general idea. Yeah. And then I took what I had written so far placed it underneath there. And then I found the gaps and then I just started writing it. And I, I took it like every single one of them was an article. 
articles mm. you can write, yeah. you know? And I got to a point where, um, you know, I was doing this on Saturdays and Sundays for about three hours each day. Uh, and I got to a point where I started losing momentum again. And I looked at my team and I said, Hey guys, I think we're in a pretty decent place right now. We have a good rhythm and a good flow. I'm going to leave for a week. Mm. And I left and this uh, coincided. My wife is in the film industry and she's working in uh, New Orleans uh, as we speak. So I wanted to visit her. Um, and I went down for two weeks and I spent one, one week where I shut everything off and mm. I plowed through and uh, day one was good. Day two and three, I started losing momentum because I was in New Orleans and I was like, Oh, <laughs> I want to go get some food. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, you know, for whatever you may believe for me, uh, I feel like God took, took some control and said, guess what? I'm going to make it rain and thunderstorm all day for five days. And so, <laughs> so day one, I looked up and I'm like, okay, I hear you. I hear you. And so I buckled yeah. down, got it over the finish line, got it into my editor's hands and then spent the two more days just refining, getting the foot news in place and all that stuff. So that's how I got there. Um, so where can folks find your book? Great question. So, um, as we speak, and probably at the time of, of when this airs, the book is right now on Kickstarter. We're trying to, um, I I'm trying to raise the funds mostly to get the audio book version done. Um, I, I do not want to sit in a studio and read that book into a microphone. And I'm convinced that somebody with a British accent is going to do a better job anyway. So, um, I, I, I want to hire the talent and I want to get it produced. Uh, so we're, I'm looking to raise uh, $12,000 and, um, we're recording this on, uh, June 17th. Mm -hmm. And so far that Kickstarter has been live for a few days and we're 15% of the way there. Um, hopefully when this airs, we're a lot closer, but the goal is to get, um, get that funded by people. And that'll also give me a gauge about how excited people are about this. There's some great pledge, um, uh, packages on there. Uh, so in the book I've, I've designed and created, uh, what I think are great collages, uh, uh that represent those stories. So this should be a reminder of those lessons and those are going to be available hand signed and numbered limited edition lithography, uh, prints. Um, mm -hmm. so there's some of that in, in the packages. And then my favorite is the ultimate package, which I'm pretty sure Josh is going to hop on guys. So it may not be available, but for $1,500. Okay. Don't say no, just, just consider for $1,500. You get book, you get a, a few of the prints, t-shirt, uh, yada, yada, but I will fly to wherever you are in the continental United States of America. And I will hang out with you for one hour wearing a full suit bull costume. And you can ask me any question that you want during that hour. <laughs> So <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> so my, my mom has not bought that one, which I don't know if I'm happy or sad about, but <laughs> I'm hoping someone does. <laughs> she's familiar with your bull, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's like, dude, all I have to do is ask you to come up and you're going to come. I'm like, whatever, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> help, help right. your favorite son out, you know? Exactly. Exactly. No, that is awesome. So what was your thought? Um, so obviously I knew you had a Kickstarter. That was the softball question to get you to talk about that. But yeah. what was the thinking behind um, going Kickstarter? Um, like what what pushed you over the edge? I mean, obviously you can get some cash up front and go do the recording. Um, what, what, what was some of the, I guess, the trade-offs? Like, oh, if I don't do Kickstarter, this is better. But if I do do Kickstarter, here's what's a, what's a better option. Yeah. You know, I talked, I talked to a few folks who have um, had books published um, and I'm not anti-publisher, but from what I understand is unless you're a very well-known human and have the uh, fame as your backing, uh, you're not really going to get much. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to get some amazing, you know, upfront bonus and yada, yada, yada. Um, and what they're really offering you is a mechanism for promotion and marketing and PR. Mm -hmm. I own a marketing and company and I'm like, okay. And I feel like we have a, a pretty good network of folks, uh, from the grits and grids work that we've been selflessly doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me, it's like, 
while I'm not adverse to a publisher, I'd rather spend my time, uh, one, leveraging my network, two, getting a gauge as to how much of a, a, a palette there is for this book. Mm-hmm. Um, and then three, I, I get to maintain a lot of the money from sales as opposed to giving most of it away to a publisher in exchange for a signing bonus that I probably already blew through. Um, so my thinking is self-publish this, own it outright and own the creative uh, guidance and leadership. I can get it out quicker because I don't need to use one of their editors and have them chop it all up. And then when it does well, positive thinking, when it does well, I'll have a a more of a leg to stand on with a publisher. Um, You know, meaning, Hey guys, I sold X amount of this. So what are you offering me for real? And you know, that's, that's me being completely honest. Yeah. That totally makes sense. I love the fact that you're, you're doing another book that you're going the Kickstarter route. You know, I, I started to try um, Kickstarter myself for a book back in Gosh, it was like 2008, 2009. So it was like right in the middle of all the junk and was not good. Like we didn't know what we were doing launching on Kickstarter. Um, but uh, but I think it's such a cool platform and I've seen others be really successful with it. So wish you lots of luck there, especially with your British voiceover guy. <laughs> like he's going to be awesome or maybe she's going to be awesome. I don't know. Um, so, you know, maybe going back to some of the questions that we probably talked through before, but it's been a few years. So I want to kind of get your gauge now. Um, when you think of all the things that you're doing right now in the book and, uh, you know, vigor and all of the different foci. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely that plural. Have. Yeah. It's always good to work in foci. What would you say it is that you are most obsessed with right now? I I remain being fully obsessed with this industry, the restaurant industry in particular, there, there are just so many nuances and details. And I know that, I mean, every industry has that, but this is one that never ceases to amaze me. Um, It teaches me how much I don't know uh, at the same time as teaching me how much I do know. And there's, there's always a fire. You know, I just feel like it's never, it's never done in a, in a beautiful way. And so I I remain completely obsessed with the restaurant industry from, from beginning to end, from the, uh, the, the 13 year old bus boy, the whole way up to the seasoned veteran who's at, you know, a board member at this point. Hmm. Yeah. That's super cool. Um, you know, another question I'm sure we asked you before and we'll have to go back and and review and see if your answers have changed at all. But um, what would you say is your favorite piece of advice, either that you have received or your favorite piece of advice to pass along to team members? Um, there's so much advice out there that is so good. If, if I had to pick one, it's going to be something antithetical to a movement that's been happening for the last like three or four years. I've seen a lot of videos and I've seen a lot of in-person um, speakers b- before the pandemic uh, quite honestly tout F the hustle. Mm-hmm. And I got to say my biggest piece of advice now is F F the hustle, 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 do it. Like if everybody else is effing the hustle there, it is a ripe opportunity to hustle hard. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I have this, maybe it's because of the time I spent in New York and, and living in Pennsylvania, but it's like this can't stop, will stop attitude. And I refuse to believe any of those speakers who say F the hustle, cause every single one of them hustled to get to the point to where they could speak to you about effing the hustle. <laughs> right. um, and so that, that would be my one piece of advice is, you know, don't, don't be swayed by what other people around you are saying or doing. Um, don't go with the flow. Just, hustle your ass off, man. And things will start to fall into place. Be open to seeing patterns, you know, um, don't just do something because you think it's the right move or the best move. Just be open to what the world's telling you. And, and the world does tell you things. Yeah. I love that. Um, you know, especially if you're young in your career, like there's so much yeah. ground to be gained and, um, and this is, you know, there are these, 
moments that will happen to like, hopefully we'll never have anything quite like COVID again, but you know, these things are cyclical. There are downturns, there are um, recessions and, and coming out of those are the moments where you can get catch up so far or get so much further ahead if that's something you desire to do. So that yeah. definitely resonates. So, all right, before we wrap up here, um, do you have any asks of our audience, like any challenges or any things that you would like um, encourage our audience to try? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, for personal development, um, I would say try turning off the uh, the music and turn on books and mm. podcasts. I mean, obviously they're listening to podcasts now, but um, you know, you, you can multitask quite well. Like <laughs> um, I know you're about to go for a run and I, I've been walking very fast and sort of running uh, during the pandemic. I, I lost 40 yeah. pounds doing oh, it. Congratulations. Um, so I, I would say I'd encourage you to get, get a hold of your diet. Um, you don't have to be a health freak. You don't have to be, um, someone that's counting every peanut, but you'd be surprised how much garbage you're putting into your, to your body every day. So think about your diet and here's why it's not about aesthetics, although that's a nice, um, nice byproduct. It's about mental. And, and when you are eating better, you become clear in your mind. And when you're clear mm -hmm. in your mind, you're able to absorb more. And then when you do listen to those audiobooks and those podcasts, you retain more information, you have more energy, and you'll find yourself writing a freaking book. Um, <laughs> you know, so that would be my challenge to everyone is to start taking your health very seriously. Um, and this is coming from a person who at the age of the 34 had his chest cut open to fix his heart. You know, I had an open heart surgery very young. Um, and yet even after that, I still didn't get control of my health. It wasn't until the pandemic to where I started taking it seriously. Um, and I, I would say that's the biggest challenge. And from there springs forth all the energy and momentum you need to just grapple ahead and climb whatever mountain you're trying to climb. Um, when you're clear headed and you're, um, you know, you, you you have good nutrition in your, in your body you tend to do everything so much better. Yeah, that's great advice. All right, Joseph. So the Kickstarter campaign will still be live when this airs theoretically. And uh, where else can folks find you on the web and learn more about Vigor? Yeah. So you can find me personally on LinkedIn. I pretty much accept every single request so long as you're not trying to sell me um, web development services. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, you can find me on Instagram at Zala Palooza. That's S Z A L A P A L O O S Z A. Ooh, mouthful. Um, and then Vigor, it's at Vigor Branding on most platforms and vigorbranding.com. Um, we, we love talking to anyone and we're very, we're very open as a uh, part of our culture. So please feel free to reach out. If you need advice, want advice, I'm happy to take a 15 to 30 minute call just about any time. Well, hey man, it was great to have you back for whatever this is, the third, third go round, I yeah. think. Third maybe, time's charm. <laughs> maybe fifth, if we count the times I was on your show or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Which will be coming up again soon, just for those that don't know. Well, there you go. Well, thanks for being with us again. And thanks for being obsessed with design. Always a pleasure, Josh. Thanks. Okay, kids, that's episode 163 in the books. Hey guys, just a quick note to say the Bullhearted brand Kickstarter has closed. It was successful. And so we'll drop a link to that in the show notes so you can check out all of that original info as well as you can head over to bullhearted.co to learn more about the book and follow along on the production. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.